I've made quite a few videos on how to build your own NAS with used PC components, and I've even made a few videos talking about pre-built NAS appliances. But today, we're not going to be building or buying, we're going to be hacking. Okay, not really hacking, but we're just going to put our own software on this thing. I don't think TerraMaster is going to like that too much. Now, hacking a NAS is fun, but you don't want to hack up your beard with cheap trimmers. Instead, get the new Beard Hedger from today's sponsor, Manscaped. For the longest time, I would waste money on cheap trimmers that didn't work half the time and had like 15 different guard attachments to deal with. And I'm so glad that I now have this. It has 20 different length options without even having to change out the guard. With its high quality titanium coated T-Blade and 7200 RPM motor, you won't be missing any hairs or suffering from any painful snags. Plus, it's waterproof so you can save time by trimming things up in the shower. As a tech nerd, I also love the use of USB-C for charging, which you won't really need much thanks to the 60 minutes of runtime. And it's super easy to take on the go thanks to this sweet little carrying case. You can get yours for 20% off plus free shipping by going to manscaped.com and using the code HARDWAREHAVEN at checkout. Give your beard the love it deserves with the Beard Hedger. This is the TerraMaster F2 223, a simple and relatively affordable two-bay NAS that TerraMaster sent over to me to make a video on. Now, really quick, I want to be clear on something. As with any of my videos where I accept hardware from different brands, they didn't pay me anything, and I made it very clear from the get-go that I would be doing whatever I wanted in this video without any of their input, which is probably apparent at this point. My biggest gripe with the F2 223 isn't the NAS at all, but the TOS operating system. I won't be covering it much, but you can check out a great review of the F2 423 from Radal here, where he goes into quite a bit more detail on TOS. I did at least install and play around with it for a bit, and to be fair, the initial setup was pretty painless. I had an SMB share up and running in just a few minutes, but once you move past the basics, it gets fairly rocky. I tried setting up the provided MB application, which wouldn't let me select the file path to my media storage. I gave Docker a go, but the UI is super clunky and lacking in features compared to something like Portainer or Casa OS. For example, I couldn't add a device to my Jellyfin container, which meant I couldn't take advantage of the hardware accelerated video transcoding. The video surveillance management application seemed to be working, but completely broke whenever I tried to set up recording schedules. I tried wiping some NVMe drives to use as a cache pool, but there wasn't a simple wipe option, only a secure erase function that would have taken Five. hours per drive. I also had issues getting any type of sync application to work, and it just wasn't the most pleasant experience. But what this NAS lacks in terms of software, it makes up for with its hardware. The F2223 is small, quiet, and feels solid. Plus, it looks great in my opinion. It features an Intel Jasper Lake N4505 dual-core CPU that supports QuickSync if you're interested in hardware-accelerated video transcoding. It comes with 4GB of DDR4, but has an open second slot and can officially support up to 32GB. It obviously has two hot swappable drive bays that can support 3.5 or 2.5 inch SATA drives, and also has two NVMe slots inside. On the back, there are two 2.5 gigabit Intel NICs, as well as USB 3.0 ports, and an HDMI output. I didn't have a ton of spare drives on hand, but I had two of these 10 terabyte Western Digital drives that were actually retired recently from a NAS at my work, so they might have some uh, issues. They at least made it through this video, although one liked to get a little toasty. I also installed two of these 256 gigabyte Team Group NVMe drives. The system runs really quiet and is pretty power efficient. It ran right next to me on my desk all week and I basically couldn't ever hear it. At idle, I was pulling around 20 to 25 watts from the wall, but that was with all four drive slots populated, which those probably pulled at least 12 watts or so on their own. This system is shockingly easy to work on, only requiring four screws to be removed to get access to the NVMe drives, second RAM slot, internal USB port, and even the CMOS battery. If you remove four more screws, you can actually get the entire motherboard out. So as you can see, this is actually just a fairly simple x86 computer. It even just has a PCIe slot for the SATA backplane. So realistically, we can install whatever we want on this thing. And I decided to try out Open Media Vault. 
First, I took out this little USB flash drive from the internal port because this is what installs TOS when you start up the NAS for the very first time. Then I just used my Ventoid drive, which already had an Open Media Vault ISO on it, to install the operating system like I have many other times on this channel. Once it was installed, I wiped the drives, which was a little bit of a hassle as I had to use DD to wipe metadata and so on, but that's not really a hardware thing, that's a me not wiping them ahead of time thing. But I eventually got Open Media Vault set up without any issue. I also installed Casa OS, as I did in my Open Media Vault plus Casa OS video, to let me easily manage some containers like Jellyfin and Duplicati. It did take me a bit to figure out hardware transcoding, but that was just because Intel Jasper Lake CPUs only support what's called low power encoding mode. And that requires just a little bit of setup on the host operating system, but after that, encoding worked just fine. If you're trying to set something up similar, I'll put a link in the description to the instructions on Jellyfin's website. At this point, everything was working as expected. Open Media Vault can be a bit annoying at times, but I had zero issues working with the hardware. If it wasn't right next to me, I would have had no way of knowing that I wasn't just working with any other PC. Well, other than one issue. For whatever reason, I always had issues in the BIOS getting the boot order to work properly. It often seemed like I needed to manually boot into the correct drive twice before it would automatically reboot to the correct device on its own. Often I would just end up here with the system doing nothing. And it wasn't just a grub or OMV thing either. I even ran into the issue when running TOS once, so I'm not exactly sure what was wrong and it it's very likely it was me. Granted, I haven't really run into that issue a whole lot in the past. With a bit of tinkering though, I was always able to get it working as expected. Now I know there are a few of you out there already typing up your comment about why I didn't choose TrueNAS. Well, first of all, you can go check out Radal's follow-up video where he does install TrueNAS here, and you definitely should since it features a cameo from a pretty awesome YouTuber. But even if I had installed TrueNAS, I would get a comment asking why I didn't use Unraid. <laughs> oh wait, I did. The Unraid installation is a bit different as it boots from a flash drive, but I didn't really have any issues with that either. Well, except for also running into some of the same BIOS boot order issues. But once again, I got that sorted out after a little bit. Unraid is probably a better fit for this NAS in my opinion, as I was able to use both SSDs in a cache pool thanks to the bootable USB, and getting apps up and running is a breeze in Unraid. But I know some people are going to comment about how it isn't free, and how I should just install Open Media Vault instead, but hey, I already did, so now we've just, we've just come full circle. I'm figuring out this YouTube thing, guys. So after getting hands-on with the F2-223, would I recommend it? Well, if you're wanting something that's small, good looking, quiet, and efficient to use as a NAS, and maybe to run a few apps or services on, then it's honestly probably worth the money. It's pretty hard to find DIY components that can give you something similar to this. I just probably wouldn't use TerraMaster's operating system. If you don't really care about size or looks, and you're just looking for performance on a budget, I would definitely look into building your own NAS from a used PC or something similar. Even after adding removable drive cages and 2.5 gigabit NICs, you're still probably going to save a good amount of money. So that's my recommendation to you, the consumer, but I also want to make a recommendation to TerraMaster, as I imagine someone from there is watching this. It'd be kind of weird if they weren't. Anyway, stop trying to compete directly with Synology and friends, because as of right now at least, the software and support don't even come close. In my opinion, your secret sauce is right here. Your hardware is pretty great honestly, and it provides what few other NAS brands out there can. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't have your own software, but maybe focus on providing support for people to use alternative operating systems. Make a true NAS install guide on your website. Make the boot manager easier to operate. Don't void your warranty when people don't want to use your software. Just be more of a hardware company. Now I know this might be a long shot, but it would be awesome if you almost standardized your cases and boards a bit more. I mean, I would love to pay you money down the road to upgrade my chassis and backplane to be able to add more drives, or to keep the case but be able to upgrade the motherboard. Now I'm not an engineer or product manager or anything, so maybe it's a bad idea, but I just feel like it would be a really easy win for you guys to just lean into the tinkerer and home lab community a bit more. Then you would have YouTubers like me raving all day about how awesome your products are, rather than making videos like this. Still though, thanks for sending it over, and I'm excited to see what you guys do in the future. Now, if you guys like this video, why am I holding this? 
If you liked this video and want to support the channel, you can always like and subscribe as that actually does go a long way. But if you want to support even more, you can spend a dollar a month on Patreon or actually now by request YouTube memberships to get early access and a few other cool perks. As always, thanks for watching, stay curious, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.